Hello, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Great. Um, we've got a, about 100 people now, so I think we will make a start. Um, a very good morning to everyone from all over the world and a warm welcome to our inaugural aspect webinar. No matter which part of the world you are in right now, I'm sure that you have all been impacted by our current COVID-19 pandemic in many ways. The virus is the same everywhere, but it has had many different impacts on countries and how they respond to the invisible enemy. Some places have done better than others, but there are reasons, uh, but there are many reasons uh, as to why this is so. So maybe the quality of the healthcare system, the culture of the people uh, with regards to following official advice and rules, the organization of public uh, uh, agencies, and the decisiveness and clarity of thinking of the country's leadership. So all the above have a bearing on the outcome, but there's another critical element, which is communication. And for the matter of fact, science communication that plays an equally important role in our battle against COVID-19. So today, we have gathered four distinguished speakers from all around Asia who will share how each of their country had responded to the pandemic and also touch on the importance of science communication during the pandemic. So first, let me welcome the Executive Director of ASPEC, Ms. Maribel, to say a few words. Maribel, please. Good morning, everyone. Hello, ASPEC family. Um, I would just like to say a few words as soon as my computer. You made me uh, the, the picture, so. Okay. Uh, I would like to welcome all our ASPAC family members and partners who have come to join us in this first ASPAC webinar in these unprecedented times. In the past three months, we have all been busy trying to cope with what's happening that we are only able to share information in our letters to the network, our FB page, and our website as to what our member institutions are doing. While some networks plunged, sorry, while some members plunged into active exchange in Zooms, our members seem to have been very aware that what we are all doing to cope were not yet best practices because they have not been tried before in this kind and in this duration. We are all experimenting and that while all knew we were there for each other, it was still a free fall of reactions. Now the three months have passed, as good old fermented Asian food goes, we can now mine insights and plug into active discussions with a good amount of information from the three months to help us move forward. We in Asia Pacific seem to have this let the dust settle first kind of response. The dust has far from settled, but three months worth of information gives us a good scope to cover in this first series of webinars and forums. And we are working on more ASPAC web member initiated webinars. This webinar, Science Communications in Viral Times, is relevant now more than ever, and sadly, also in the future, as they will happen again. So thank you so much to Dr. Gultam of the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, Dr. Yasushi Kebe of Miraikan, Dr. Ganigar Chen of Thailand, a good friend, Professor Lim, my favorite human, and of course, Song Chun Li, who led this. Aside from those, there will be other ASPAC Zoom conferences, foremost of which is the first ever ASPAC Masterclass for Emerging Leaders, which I'm reminding all our member institutions to register their, their participant for. We need this more than ever. We will also have our first ever cross-network science engagement executive forums in September, October, and November for senior leaders across networks to discuss three main themes our reimagined vision of our social responsibility, financial sustainability, and managing our organizations for change. These thoughtful interactions form part of what I would like to call designing the weight, which is our natural role in science engagement institutions to help create a better normal. So thank you very much all for joining us, and I'm looking forward to all the discussions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maribel. Okay, that was a very great uh, start. So uh, let me first introduce our first speaker. So he is none other than Associate Professor Thich Ming Lim, who is the Chief Executive of Science Center Singapore. 
His other titles include the President of the Singapore Association of the Advancement of Science, President of the Singapore National Academy of Science, the Vice President of the Association of Singapore Attractions, and President of ASPEC. He also serves in the Board of Directors of Tamasek Innovate Foundation and was a director on the Board of Association of Science and Technology Centres from 2013 to 2018. He has also served in the Ayapa Museum subcommunity. So let me first welcome TM uh, to kickstart the webinar. TM, please. Well, uh, thank you, Song Chun. Thank you, Maribel, and thank you to all our friends. Um, I know time is precious, so I'll jump in. Uh, let me share screen. Uh, oh, my slide. You can see the slide, right? Yeah, okay. I will. Uh... Okay. Um, this is an important topic and very timely topic. Uh, uh, I must also qualify that uh, when all this pandemic happens, uh, our science center went into some kind of a shutdown. So I'm going to present to you uh, how Singapore does it uh, in terms of communication from national level all the way down to individuals and, and, and so on. Uh, to give you a bit of background, uh, we but have... The slides are not up. The slides are not up. Not up? Not up yet, sorry. yeah. Um, hey, sorry. What, what should I do now? Because uh, I, I thought I said shared. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah? No uh, worries. Share screen. Did I say shared screen? Share content. Share. Uh, share, yeah. Is this in? The slide? Yep, coming on, yes. Okay. okay yep. Yes, yes, right. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let me uh, start from the beginning. Okay. Okay, good. right. Yeah, so you can see the slide, yeah. And uh, just to give you the background, uh, Singapore experienced four waves of uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, this graph I just updated this morning uh, because this, this graph is actually a live graph. Uh, we imported the first cases from China in January and then in wave two, uh, we started to see local clusters uh, of, of pandemic uh, infection. And when the government decided to pull back all the Singaporeans living overseas, especially overseas students, uh, we experienced the third wave in March. And then came wave four, that is uh, our migrant workers who live in the, the dormitories uh, started to spread from April onwards. And you can see from the graph that there is a high number reported because we went into very proactive screening, regardless of whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic. Uh, but we see a very low fatality rate, uh, 26 out of the 45,000 or so. And mainly because uh, those infected are healthy, uh, I mean, uh, not healthy, uh, uh, they are, uh, are young and, and uh, robust people, so called. And our health service uh, system has never been overwhelmed because of our very uh, systematic way of organizing our health care. Uh, and because this is a, a pandemic, so the government uh, set up a multi-ministerial committee uh, and we have daily update, daily press conference and the Prime Minister uh, periodically will go on national uh, broadcast to update of all the situations. And we have a system of uh, uh, reporting our uh, alert level. Uh, it's called DOSCON. DOSCON stands for uh, Disease Outbreak uh, Response Condition. And we are still in orange. We never went into red because uh, red means total shutdown uh, and things are now under much control. And in the multi-ministerial uh, committee, we have also uh, medical doctors, uh, educators, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Manpower, uh, briefing people on a daily basis. And we set up a gov.sg because uh, that is the official website and official uh, apps to update all the numbers. And uh, when the pandemic is, is, is hit us and it's a novel uh, coronavirus, it's very important that uh, the nation rolled out uh, all out education and outreach. Uh, the education comes from a very official channel like here on the screen, you can see uh, Professor Yo Yisin, she is the uh, head of our uh, Infectious Disease Center and uh, she went through uh, and managed our SARS pandemic uh, previously. And when, when, uh, when this uh, COVID-19 hit us, uh, there was a time that uh, based on then, uh, the, the advice by ex expert is uh, only when you're not well that you put on a mask. Uh, so there was this cartoon that uh, went around 
Uh, but now, uh, with evidence showing that uh, even asymptomatic people can spread, so this masking up has become uh, something that all of us have to adhere to. So this is one example of at that point in time when it first hit us, the communication was of this. But now, uh, the knowing of how the disease spread and the importance of uh, discovering even asymptomatic carrier uh, will, will harbor the virus. And therefore, now it is a, a change of the advice. And we also need to teach people how to put on the face mask. Uh, apparently, not many people know how to put on the face mask. And Singapore also set up a, a very special uh, uh, public health preparedness clinic, uh, PHPC, and it's heavily subsidized. And these clinics have got a very good uh, uh, protocols to, to admit uh, suspects cases to the hospital. And in order to educate people, we have our comedians, we have our TV personality, went on TV show using all kinds of uh, languages and dialect to mass public uh, educate all our people. Uh, so on the bottom left corner, you see a TV a short skit about how people should really go and see doctor and don't hop from doctor to doctors. And uh, we also have got a, a ground up initiative. Uh, you can see in the middle, Kim Kwat. Uh, he is a well-known uh, blog podcast person. He always put in very interesting video. And he has a series of how we should deal with uh, COVID-19 in public. So there's one episode of him in the bus. And on the bottom right corner is a, is a favorite and also very popular uh, comedian in Singapore. And she came out with a whole series using, again, very layman language to educate people about how to cope with COVID-19. And all these are important platforms, officially, unofficially, informal and formal. We reach all out to Singaporeans. And then we face another problem that is uh, when, when, a, when the COVID virus hit uh, and the hospital people are working very hard, uh, they work day and night. And, and then when they came out to, to go to buy food and or went into public transport, they were ostracized. And, uh, and it's very sad because they were risking their life, they're serving, and they have actually observed very high hygienic protocol. And yet there were people who told them to get out. Uh, so the, the nation came together to communicate this important fact about how professionals are well-trained. So don't treat them as if they are going to be uh, carriers to come to the public. And we mobilize uh, both uh, students and public, uh, like you can see on the top left corner, students uh, make cards and send cards to encourage and, uh, and, and spread appreciation to all the frontline workers. And even our prime minister himself during uh, Valentine's Day, he, he wrote a private card, personal card to, to send a, a Valentine's message to all our frontline uh, people. And at, at the national level, there are all kinds of organizations that come, came together to, to, to make uh, songs and encouragement to uh, spread the message that we are together to fight this COVID virus uh, pandemic in Singapore. Uh, I don't know whether you can see the, the, the we are allowed back to work. That is another bottom-up uh, initiative uh, to, to spread the, the practice. Avoid men, meaning avoid touching mouth, ear, eyes and nose, avoid touching. So M, E, M, E, and eyes, yeah? Uh, and then uh, instead, we should follow uh, women to, to fight. The we is uh, wash your hands and then uh, put on a mask and, and uh, don't anyhow travel and so on and so forth. Uh, and we are also very mindful of the needs to reach out to special needs uh, individuals, so there are special care kits. And uh, a lot of uh, education in terms of safe distancing. And to do that, we also have our government rollout uh, app, Trace Together app. And this is very important because uh, with, it, with this app and scanning to wherever you go to, it will give a record of where you have been so that the next phase, if necessary, the contact tracing will, will, will let you know if you have gone to a place where uh, certain suspect cases or certain confirmed cases have been detected. And uh, this part about contact tracing is very important. And uh, in Singapore, we do it in a very timely manner and very transparent manner. And we spend a lot of effort to do contact tracing. And all the, 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 the contract tracing are shown in infographic manners, in the press, in the newspaper, in, in social media, and so on. And we also uh, uh, highlight where are the places that have been visited by the latest COVID-19 patients to alert people to be very careful. And you can see a little uh, map uh, on the bottom of the screen uh, where you see the hotspot uh, being uh, reported. Again, this is a mass education uh, outreach and, and timely report to to let people know that uh, we should avoid uh, going to places where there are previous cases uh, happened. Uh, this, this contact tracing will allow us to trace all the way back to the source. And
and therefore we can isolate and advise the local community or families accordingly, right? And here comes the science center's role. Uh, when this COVID-19 uh, happened, uh, we were still able to open, uh, but very quickly uh, we went into the uh, orange uh, alert and, and we have to, government have to come in to do a circuit breaker. And during the circuit breaker time, uh, we fill in the gaps by uh, posting educational video with our Ministry of Education, uh, reach out to all the schools to, to tell them about how this pandemic may spread through uh, uh, improper uh, behavior. And we also uh, roll out a lot of online resources to help uh, during the school shutdown time, uh, learn from home. So we have this Science at Home series and we do video, we do infographic, we do uh, also uh, workshop uh, hands-on activities that people can do at home. And lately, we have just uh, signed on a contract to bring in a new uh, introspectral novel coronavirus because this is where we can then use the Science Centre as we prepare for reopening. It will come in to really educate people with the, the virus and the biology and how technology can serve uh, to, to uh, tackle that. And one thing about science is that the more we know, the more we do not know. As we hear more and more discovery about coronavirus, uh, this I just took up from a nature website uh, just uh, this month. Uh, after six months of coronavirus, there are still many mysteries that scientists do not know. We are still trying to solve the problem. And, uh, and uh, this is where uh, we need to come in as a science center because all this needs to be in our narratives, especially when we reopen uh, to educate the public. Uh, what I like to say is that uh, this highly contagious COVID-19 cannot wait for our full scientific understanding to tackle so at every turn of the crisis of this warfare, we have to use evidence-based logical thinking to isolate, to treat, to, to, to break the circuit's spread. And uh, not by hindsight critica criticizing uh, why we never did this or why we never did that. Uh, science is always uh, knowing the unknown as more we know, the more we will know what to do. Uh, so we have to learn from the past pandemics like SARS taught us many things. And then as we discover about the novel virus, uh, I think the safest response, and this is what also what uh, we are trying to propagate uh, from the science centers, uh, that every individual is to understand how uh, the virus spread, and that is about science literacy. We need to tell them that this is science; it's, it's, it's not something mystery. We need to know how virus uh, multiply, and 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 also how we can use discipline, and we should use discipline and hygienic behavior plus appropriate personal uh, uh, conduct, wearing protective gears like mask and so on. Uh, to keep the virus at bay. And this brings us the cultural and social behavioral aspect. And again, as a science center, we need to combine this. We cannot just look at science alone. We should look at cultural and social science, and then we can come up with a, a proper so-called uh, outreach. Uh, so while we wait for a new biomedical, which is to me is a STEM uh, solution, we must be responsible in our community and to get everyone to cooperate to break the virus circuit. And I like this uh, uh, little slogan, uh, V-I-R-U-S, spell virus. But if you remove I and U together, I and U can break the virus circuit. And this is where we have to emphasize the togetherness and Science Center uh, uh, will work with our government to have this together uh, campaign to reach out and, and help to communicate and cope with the virus pandemic. And there are many, many technologies used. And uh, in Singapore, we explain this in the public. And I think this will become very interesting stories for us when we uh, reopen our science center to educate. And uh, we also need to uh, tell people about how certain drugs, uh, why Singapore is not using it, because we use science and use evidence to whether take in or not take in certain treatment. And all this will become very interesting stories, as I said, when we reopen a science center or even when we go online to educate people using science uh, evidence-based uh, communication. And uh, Singapore has, has uh, put in a lot of effort. It's a top-down and bottom-up combination. And uh, we do contact tracing. We test uh, very strictly of all the cases. And we do very strong communication from all walks of life to all levels of government. And uh, we are very organized in terms of reaching out. And the numbers on the left shows we have also, uh, government have given out more than 3.5 million of uh, surgical masks and almost 10,000 uh, uh, reusable masks. And we also uh, are very strict in terms of people who violate uh, the, the safe distancing practice, uh, they get fined uh, or they get noticed. We also send out a stay-home notice and so on. Uh, so 
overall, it is a pandemic, and I think Science Centre uh, play a role to communicate science and to work with the community together. Uh, so I'll stop here, uh, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, TM. So does anyone have any questions? So please feel free to let us know. We got a few minutes for Q&A, a short Q&A here. If you're shy, you can actually type your question in the, in the chat group. Well, uh, uh, if there are no questions, I just want to say that uh, I don't know about your science center, but in, in our science center, uh, we, because it's so novel that we can't come up with a so-called uh, virus exhibition yet. Uh, and so we are now preparing for the reopening. And that's why we brought in the introspectral uh, uh, story that we want to use that as, as a platform to really narrate the story of the COVID virus and also go deep into the science and biomedical advancement of that. Uh, uh, Okay, right. Was there any question that anybody want to? I mean, any question? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Maribel, good. Maribel, yeah. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that I really like the, it's very clear that the thrust, the science communication is very clear that we can't prevent it yet because yeah. there's no vaccine. So I really like it that break the circuit. I really, really like that. I hope we could have stickers <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> the circuit. <laughs> Yeah, we, we um, at the Science Center, we are putting out quite a lot of stickers. We're preparing for reopening, I think, next week, if we can get all cleared. And uh, we are also following very strict uh, regime. Uh, we have got a safety management manual. We have to make it as a policy. And we also have to follow the a standard, which is called the SG Green, a uh, clean, sorry, SG Clean, Singapore Clean. And we actually... Uh, had that certified before we, we, we shut down because uh, when the pandemic hit us uh, by February or so, we already knew that we need to up our routine of cleaning and our, up our routine of communicating. And now, uh, as we prepare for the reopening, uh, we also don't allow on-site ticketing. We have to purchase online tickets so there's no queuing up on the site. And then uh, we have stickers all over uh, to tell people how to do safe distancing. We also limit our group no more than five coming in. Unless you are family, you can, you can actually be very close with one another, but you are not family members, you are supposed to observe very uh, stringent uh, safe distancing. And, and to, uh, uh, that's where uh, I also told our team that we should use the opportunity to educate all the people coming in because it's not just about science, it's about cultural, it's about social behavior. And we're also coming up with uh, activities to reinforce this. And we hope that uh, when it comes to the science center, it's not just to learn about science, but to learn about responsible behavior to break the, the, the spread of the circuit. That's why the I and you have to play the part. Uh, science is still trying to unravel uh, the, the situation. Yeah. Okay, you have that question is coming in now. Ah, okay. So the, one, one question from uh, Siok Man. Uh, what are the challenges that Science Centre faces when conducting activities through online platform? Ah, um, we, we had a short time to ramp up and I think one of the major challenges is that all our people are working from home. So all the really homemade, really home video kind of uh, setting. Uh, so so uh, in terms of uh, professionalism, it's a lot depending on, on our staff who are more who are creative enough to make use of the limited uh, conditions they have. But we use online meeting to coordinate how we standardize the way we present, how we uh, make sure that when we present, there's a, uh, there's a story, there's a narrative, there is a call to action kind of format. So the, the challenges are actually, physically we are not together, so a lot of things got through online and also from home, uh, we, we created using whatever limited uh, resources that we have. Good. Uh, there's another question. So, uh, by Bing from NSM Thailand. So, uh, she asked, so how do you measure success on online media? Ah, this is the question that all of us ask. Uh, so, of course, important, uh, simple one is how many people click. Uh, but clicking itself is not uh, an indicator. So, we also look at how long they dwell on, on the, the video. And uh, somehow, there's also certain, certain analytic to see if they, they have uh, so-called like it or warm to it. Uh, mm. 
yeah, so, so we use multiple indicators. Uh, we are still learning. So if you have good ideas, do share with us. All of us are trying to learn how to measure the impact. Uh, and of course, yeah. the, the number of sharing and the number of liking. And also, sometimes people actually wrote back to us. And uh, one of the indicators that we like is uh, some people actually wrote in to say that I have to volunteer to help you. I think that, that is very powerful. Yeah. Mm. Great. Okay, I think maybe there are no more questions. We can take further questions at the panel discussion uh, later. Okay, yeah, can I trouble you to uh, stop sharing your screen so that the next speaker can... Uh, okay, okay, thanks. Uh, okay. I... Yes, oh, okay. Can, can you, you, you cannot control me. Uh, I'm stop I cannot control you. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, I just click stop share. Okay, stop sorry, share. I yes. think okay, something that we've got to get used to. <laughs> so, no problem. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks, TM. Okay, thank okay, you. So, uh, let me introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is also another long-time friend, uh, Dr. Ganaga Chen, who is the Vice President of National Science Museum, Thailand. She has a background in biochemistry and engineering management and holds a PhD in education, man man uh, majoring in lifelong learning with a research focus on civic science literacy. She's an alumnus of the Museum Leadership Program of Noise Leadership Institute. She is also a committee of the Science Society of Thailand under the patronage of His Majesty the King. In 2013, she was awarded as Outstanding Alumni by Chulalongkong University. May I invite uh, Dr. Ganagar to start her sharing, please? Well, um, good, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation from ASPAC. I'm the old face of ASPAC. And it's nice to have a chance to join another activities uh, within the family. Um, what I'm sharing today is a compilation of the situation that has been going on in Thailand. I think we kind of follow Singapore in a way. And um, I will focus uh, a little bit more on how ecosystem of science communication has been set to support the community during this pandemic time. And um, so I'll start with the overall situation, then the size communication ecosystem, and then conclude with a few key points we learn from what has been, uh, what has happened. Okay, can you see my slide? Okay. Yes. Um, let me see if I can. Is it okay? Yes, yes. Yes. Right. Um, for, for Thailand, I think we... Just a moment. Okay. Yeah. Just a moment, I, I try to check. Okay, right. For, um, for Thailand, our first COVID-19 infected case was found in uh, January. Um, and the number climbed up gradually, uh, then started to rise exponentially in March. I think it's similar to Singapore. Huh? And that's when the government decided to take a serious measure uh, to announce emergency pandemic situation and start the lockdown. Well, as you can see, um, it took another month for something to keep the situation uh, under control. And now we have about, uh, we have zero infected uh, person already for um, 44 days for the um, domestic infection. And altogether, we have accumulated of 3,197 um, infected patients um, and 3,074 recovered and uh, 58 deaths. So um, I think so far, that's something um, the, the government has done pretty well in um, keep the situation under control. Well, I think we have to give the big credit to, to the uh, Prime Minister Prayut Chan Ocha, um, the Prime Minister and his um, emergency uh, response team for their uh, quick response to the situation. 
uh, decisive measure and the important thing is to work uh, closely with uh, consultation of um, expert scientists and doctors which uh, they have set up a committee on health and pandemic and this uh, has brought to a positive result to the situation. Well, in terms of communication, um, I think this is uh, one of the key uh, beside all the measures. Uh, actually, the government uh, set up the center called Center for COVID-19 Situation Administration uh, with the Department of Disease Control uh, Ministry of Public Health as a center of operation. And this uh, center takes full authority in fighting against COVID-19 outbreak and becoming a single point of information source regarding the outbreak situation. For months, um, the center organized press conference every day, uh, just like in Singapore, uh, nonstop to update the situation and also update the new policy launched by the government. And media has helped uh, cooperatively to broadcast repeatedly the message. Um, the center, I, I call the center CCA. CCA not only provide news, but also to communicate science uh, of the pandemic and give the guidelines for individual businesses schools and public uh, space such as market shopping malls you know to ensure everyone know um, how to manage their daily routine and to keep themselves and their family safe what i really admire in the um, communication of uh, cca is that they has appointed a very um, uh, uh, nice spoke person who are doctors um, with good communication skill and very nice charisma. Um, with the good knowledge of the spokesperson and understanding uh, of the disease and the nature of the pandemic, the spokesperson can help answering unexpected questions um, to the media and also emphasize on the important point um, to personal hygiene without any mid leading that are uh, given in any um, uh, over concern to the public. He also, um, he is also very uh, confident and convincing. I think uh, he become the trustable face of, for the media and for everyone uh, uh, who follow news uh, on television every day, including my mom. Okay, so I think for about two months he has appeared on television and people follow him. And after that, um, they have appointed another um, spoke lady, you know, this lady, uh, who is also a doctor, to become uh, the assistant spoke person. I think this strategy is very interesting and very well um, designed in terms of um, communication during this uh, pand pandemic time. Well, for um, the message that everyone in Thailand will receive, okay, it's a, a very important message. Uh, we say it in Thai, in Ron, Chon Glam, Lang Mu, which means uh, consume hot food, use serving spoon, and then wash your hands. Uh, this uh, three words, uh, if you know about uh, Thai, eating uh, culture, okay? Not only Thai food, but Thai eating culture or the way we eat. You, know, you will understand that Thai people like to share food from the same plate, uh, same spoon sometime, and sometimes use bare hand to eat food. And that's why this message is so important um, to prevent uh, the spreading of disease, especially among families, members, and close friends. Another important message that has uh, come after these three words is that put on mask. And the important point is clothing, cloth mask or fabric mask is also okay uh, for uh, non-infected uh, 
group or non, no symptom group. Therefore, even uh, with the situation that medical masks is not available, um, the public get a very good uh, guidance on um, the use of fabric masks you know, to prevent themselves. And they start to make it by themselves and using it. And then, um, you know, that helps a lot to, to control the situation. Well, um, another positive factor in the ecosystem of science communication is the fact that um, I see so many scientists and doctors, you know, are willingly engage in the public communication about the pandemic. Um, this gentleman, um, his name is Dr. Yong, who is the chief virologist of Jilalongkorn University. I think he uh, came on television maybe a uh, hundred times because a lot of uh, television channel invite him um, to, to share uh, his knowledge about what's the pandemic and how the people can protect themselves from uh, getting infected. Also here we have to thank to the media for the support and the interest to bring the real scientists, you know, to come to have a conversation um, to broadcast uh, to the public. Okay. This gentleman is a, a doctor as well. He is the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Siri Rad Hospital. And he himself had used himself as a um, presenter in many video clips and uh, give a lot of interviews, warning and giving on strict, uh, instruction on social distancing. I think this uh, Phenomena is quite, um, quite, very, uh, quite, quite positive in Thailand. We don't see many um, scientists on television before, but this time during this pandemic, we see a lot of um, scientists and doctors coming. Uh, not only these two, but these two are most, uh, most uh, frequently appear. Okay, and and I think it also uh, once uh, the leading scientists coming out to talk to the public. Uh, more scientists and more doctors are willing to come out as well. Another interesting thing is that um, Siri Rad Hospital also set up uh, anti-fake news um, uh, reply. Okay, actually they already have an anti-fake news web page, but during this time, the hospital uh, particularly set up a communication system to give of uh, accurate information against uh, various fake news that happens. Okay. And last but not least, we also have to thank to the, we call health volunteer, uh, who is, uh, who there are about a million people around the country helping to monitor and communicate to the uh, local community about um, how to keep their personal hygiene. Well, with NSM did some survey on public uh, reflection about size communication during this pandemic. We have to thank to our Malaysian friend uh, for sharing the questions and methodology on uh, conducting this survey. We found that uh, top five things that the public agree about um, COVID-19 information are, are as follows as I shown show on this slide, okay. Um, the, the public sees that the importance, uh, there's, there's a important, um, it's important to have an organization to screen and verify the right information, okay. Um, secondly, they admit that the uh, information uh, received have impact, okay, on their thinking and behavior uh, regarding how they gonna uh, take care of themselves. Um, they feel like they have trust uh, in the information from experts, okay? And 
most of them, as we can predict, uh, access the information um, through social media. And the nice thing is that the good news for us is that the public feel like during this time, the availability of the information about um, the pandemic and how to take care of themselves is enough. Okay. So I think the government has done quite a reasonable, uh, good job in this. Now, another um, thing I would like to note is that I find the relationship between um, demand and supply of science communication during the pandemic is very um, obvious. As we can see, uh, as time went by, a number of uh, various type of uh, information, you know, on the uh, pandemic, um, in terms of video uh, clips, infographic, and other medias, were hugely produced by various organizations. Not particularly uh, by organization that is responsible for this thing, but also by, um, let's say, companies, by bank, you know, everyone try to help to produce this information. Uh, you can find information about effectiveness of different type of masks, how to wear masks, how to clean masks, and how to add this post masks how to take care of yourself in various public space, and etc. This information is usually uh, come from single source, but then interpreted in or displayed in many ways. I think this is a good sign. It means this, if the information is relevant, people will look for it. And uh, if people look for it, then there will be more people create the the information, the content for the communication. This is another thing I, I was really impressed that uh, within a short time, two or three months, uh, my uh, good size communicator friend has already published a book you know, on COVID-19 in Thai language. And also there are a lot of um, good documentaries produced why? You know, why uh, we can create this kind of um, information so quickly? Because of high demand. Uh, we need to ensure reliable source of primary content. And that's why it will be useful if um, scientists take this opportunity you know, to provide those uh, content during this pan pandemic time. In summary, I would like to say that we learn about positive ecosystem in science communication during this, uh, uh, this pandemic. Uh, first, clear, precise, and unified information is important. Okay. Charismatic science communicator is useful for the uh, lay public. And scientists or expert engagement for uh, public trust and clarity is also an uh, important factor. Media support and uh, media relationship with expert is also very helpful in this situation. And uh, to be able to find ways to manage fake news, you know, uh, especially through online media is also very important. And last but not least, you know, during this sort of situation, you find interrelationship between demand and supply of science communication. And it's a good opportunity for us to take um, this crisis into uh, a productive thing in communicate science to the public. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ganaga. Very good. So are there any questions? From the floor. Okay. Uh, well, while we are waiting for questions, I just add a little bit that uh, sure. during these past few months, NSM also closed, uh, and we were busy uh, working on size delivery. Okay, deliver. We have food delivery and product delivery, but now NSM delivers size as well uh, through all our channels. 
but now we are already open. Okay. Right. Okay, maybe I'll ask a question. So now that NSM is open, do you um, see a difference uh, in the attitude of the visitors visiting NSM? Any change in behavior or attitude uh, pre and post uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I, I think uh, is, we, we can see that um, most people are very um, disciplined and they are very cooperative uh, when we ask them um, to keep the social distancing and their um, visit, um, how do you call it? The, the way they visit the, um, the venue, it's, it's more, it's improved, you know, because they, uh, because we, because of the, the space we provide is more, uh, there is more space, you know, there are more distance, people seem to spend more time you know, in the exhibition, uh, relaxing. Uh, I think maybe, you know, coming back from the uh, lock from home for a long time, allow people to have a more, how do you call, um, enjoy more to spend time in the uh, space like in a museum. We have very high number of visitation during weekend, even though uh, this number is not over, it doesn't exceed the maximum capacity we, we uh, identify during this time, but uh, we see quite a lot of people coming, you know, it's, it's a good sign, yeah. yeah. Um, um, Ganiga, you can hear me, yeah, Ganiga? Yeah. Yes. Uh, in, in, in in your presentation, you talk a lot about how uh, former scientists and doctors do communication. And uh, we all know that uh, in uh, Thailand is very good in coming up very interesting, uh, even advertisement kind of storyline. So do you also have, like in Singapore, we have a lot of ground up uh, people from the artist uh, uh, performers. They came in to tell their narrative uh, to, to educate because sometimes the, the technical term is too too high for, for laymen to understand. So do you also see a, a big movement in Thailand in, in the using comedians and uh, celebrities to communicate uh, awareness and educate on COVID-19? Thanks. Yeah, um, we, we, we do have um, some uh, program that have um, comedian or uh, celebrity to have help communicate, but and that this is um, some. This is from my observation. Um, it it helps for lay people to understand uh, certain things, but then people tend to um, to follow or to trust <laughs> the information uh, more on the scientists during this time. You know of the uh, pandemic. I, I think maybe because it's quite new. It's quite um, um, uh, unusual for, for, for all of us. That's why they are looking for source of uh, information that is um, very reliable. And yeah, so, so and, and luckily, I think uh, those scientists who come out and talk, they have pretty good uh, skill in science communication. I mean, they can uh, speak something brief and clear. So it's easy for the public to follow. But um, to answer your question, yes, we do have some uh, group of uh, comedian and um, uh, movie star celebrities to come out to help. But it seems like it's, they are not as popular as the scientists during this time. Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good to that's, know. that's quite interesting for me, you know. Yeah. Yeah, good, good to know. Thanks. Okay, we got one, uh, one last question here. So uh, thanks for sharing your reopening experience. So what advice or tips can you give to other science centers that will reopen soon? Uh, I think you, we, you should not be hurry. I mean, just make sure um, you, you get everything ready for, for um, the new normal visit. And then if there is some part that it's not supposed to be open. Um, just uh, be confident not to be not to open it, because I think the public 
trust you if you, if, I mean, trust the museum that we will provide them um, safety visit. So um, mm. don't feel hesitate to close some session or uh, still close some exhibit because I think the, the, the public or the visitors feel um, that is a, the way we show our concern. Okay, so just do it when you think you are ready. Make sure your staff is also um, uh, ready for you know the new new normal, and and then you can just um, you will give a confidence to your visitors. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Ganaga, for sharing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we'll move on to the uh, next speaker. So our third speaker is Dr. Yasushi. Uh, he's the Principal Investigator for Science Communication and a Science Communicator at Miraiken, the National Museum of Emerging Science and Innovation, Japan. After getting his PhD in astrophysics in 1995, he worked for research institutes in Japan, Germany, and the United States. Since he joined Miraiken in 2004, he has been involved in various science communication activities, including exhibit development, educational programs, experimental causes, citizen deliberation, and so forth. After the disaster in 2011 in Japan, the huge earthquake and tsunamis followed by the nuclear accident which struck in the east of Japan, he has been focusing on risks from natural disaster and technologies. So can I invite Dr. Yasushi to share his views on the COVID-19 pandemic in the Japan context? Thank you very much, Song Chan. Okay, I'm gonna... Um share my slide here okay can you can you see this yes good thanks okay um in japan there was uh, no official lockdown rather than uh, uh the main policy was to ask people self-restraint today i will tell you uh, the reason why this self-restraint policy worked and various communication problems observed behind the scene. First, uh, let's look at the infection state situation so far in Japan. This chart shows the number of new infections per day. The first case was discovered on January 15th. This person was a, a returnee from Wuhan, China. On January 28th, a tourist bus driver was found to be infected, making this the first case of person-to-person -person transmission in Japan. Following, the number of infected people gradually increased as these incidents happened in February. And many imported infection, infection triggered a rapid increase in the number of new infections. Then, a state of emergency was declared, and by mid-May, the number of infected people had been successfully reduced. As the situation progressed, the government and an expert panel provided messages to public. When the first case was found on January 15, uh, we received a rather mild message from the government saying that there is no clear evidence of a persistent person-to-person -person transmission in Japan. Then, as the number of patients increased, on February 1st, the government instructed each prefecture to establish a consultation center for returnee and uh, contacts. Finally, on February 16th, a group of experts was convened to advise on government policy. The expert panel sent a message to the public, refrain from unnecessary outing to prevent the spread of the disease by reducing contact by, with people. Later, the expert panel proposed two new measures, avoid three Cs, and 80% reduction in contact.
This is a poster uh, the government made to tell people avoid the three C's. The focus of the expert panel was the pro preventing cluster infections. Infections are most likely to occur when people gather in closed, crowded spaces with close contact settings. Therefore, the experts strongly suggest, suggested avoiding these three Cs. In addition, the expert panel called on people to reduce human contact with a quantitative target of 80% reduction. The value of 80% was proposed by this 80% uh, uncle, Professor Nishiura. He explained uh, directly to the public through a video feed on Twitter, as you can see on the right hand, hand side panel. Uh, this uh, video feed has been viewed 1.6 million times. I have the impression that these measures of uh, three seeds and 80% have spread widely and have actually contributed to the, uh, the prevention of infection. In addition, even though the restrictions imposed under the declaration of emergency were based on request for self-restraint without penalty, the public appeared to be very supportive. Why did these posters and the Twitter from experts work so well? Well, according to some analysis, the biggest factor that moved people was a feeling of fear. This curve uh, here represents the change over time in how people express their feelings about COVID-19 as derived from the analysis of Twitter sentences. Toriyumi and his colleagues analyzed about 30 million tweets related to COVID-19. In their analysis, the emotions expressed in each post are classified into several categories. And the time variation of the proportion of each emotion is calculated. Only three of the extracted emotions are shown here fear, surprise, and sadness. In the early days, most of the posts about COVID-19 expressed fear. And it peaked on the day when the first case of the person-to-person -person transmission was discovered. Since then, many emotions other than fear have appeared on Twitter. Significant changes have occurred on March 29 in response to the death of a famous comedian by COVID-19. His death was widely reported in the media and came to people's attention. And the number of new infections started to decrease after that day. The declaration of emergency was issued a week later. So the death of this famous comedian must have raised enormous fear feelings among people, leading to a change in many people's behavior and resulting in the reduction of infections. During this uh, heightened uh, sense of fear, the government declared a, a state of emergency Measures to prevent infection, such as hand washing, wearing a mask, refraining from uh, unnecessary outing, and avoiding three Cs, seems to be widespread among people. Most of the shops refrain from doing business, except those selling food and daily necessities. As most people restrict their activities in a similar manner, there were some conflicts and the communication problems. For one, uh, infected people were harassed. There was also discrimination against medical workers. Of course, many people have encouraged and thanked healthcare professionals. However, in a few uh, exceptional cases, healthcare workers and their families were treated in a discriminatory manner, as if they carry 
a high risk of infection. Restaurant and other establishments were required to shorten their hours to uh, 8 p.m., but many shops chosen to close because they could not expect customers. However, in order to ensure incomes as much as possible, some stores continue to operate under shorter hours. For those operating stores, some people anonymously used offensive words such as close the store or knock it off and urged them to stop their business. They so-called voluntary police are dividing the community by not caring about uh, the differences among people in different circumstances. Such volunteer uh, police must be criticized, but since they are anonymous and operate invisibly, no one can talk to them. Under these circumstances, the Japanese Red Cross Society has provided us with the excellent information. They explained that the discrimination emotion come from people's fear feelings and emphasizes the importance of controlling your feelings. The information was distributed via leaflets and animation from YouTube which has been played 2.2 million times. I think many people sympathize with it. In addition, I felt that there were excessive restraint under strong peer pressure. For example, there were many people who wanted to go home to care for or help their parents. There were also people who wanted to go to their parents' place to give birth. However, many people refrained from returning home. In another case, outdoor sports events were decided to be canceled, although the risk of infection would not necessarily increase. There were many cases of people excessively restricting behavior. Well, there may be various factors behind these issues, but it is necessary to conduct a sober risk assessment and make rational choices. After the state of emergency in Japan, uh, which was lifted by May 25, the number of new infections has increased uh, again significantly. Uh, since late June. In Tokyo, it was particularly high, and some infection clusters were also reported. In response to this situation, the governor of Tokyo uh, requested to Tokyo residents as please refrain from unnecessarily moving to other prefectures. So far, well, so far, the damage has been built up in various social activities, such as economic activities and education. And as you can see on the lower panel, the Twitter analysis showed that many citizens are opposed to further restraint. We should weigh uh, the risk of self-restraint against the risk of infection and judge them rationally. So what should we do? A quantitative risk assessment tool will become essential for a risk assessment and rational judgment. For example, Professor Miyata is working on creating an infection forecast map. Forecast map. They use a communication app called LINE, which is like WeChat or WhatsApp. They send out questionnaires to LINE users to generate big data about people's current health condition, identify areas with high risk of COVID-19 infection, and visualize those, uh, visualize those locations. It may be an effective tool for individuals to assess the risk-benefit balance 
to prevent infection and minimize the suppression of activities. In order to live wisely with the novel coronaviruses, we need tools to, to visualize these uh, invisible risks. And we need to be prepared to face those risks. So let me summarize. As uh, COVID-19 spread, uh, the feeling of fear was a major driving force for people to change their behavior. On the other hand, fear also causes, caused discrimination and prejudice. In addition, it seems that uh, there were many unbalanced and excessive restraint in people's behavior. This coping with the novel coronavirus situation is likely uh, to last for a while. Under such circumstances, not only, not only policies based on scientific risk assessment are required, but also tools to visualizing uh, risks and the communication for dealing with the risks are required so that individuals can weigh risks against, against benefits and calmly make rational judgments. Together, we need to further develop science communication and put it into practice. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zasushi. It's very informative. So do we have any questions from the floor? Maybe we'll take a couple questions. Okay, there's one question coming in. Okay, uh, this question. Um, thank you for fleshing out the psychological dimension of COVID-19, which sometimes gets overlooked in the conversation around mitigation. It's refreshing to see how Japan managed the harassment of an infected person discrimination against healthcare workers and criticism of restaurants that continue to operate. In your opinion, was this enough to address the uh, psychological impact of COVID-19 and build the mental resilience of the public? What else could have been done in retrospect? Mm, that's a very uh, difficult question because the, uh, well, a lot of things are anonymously done and uh, those kind of criticism to the uh, infected people or medical professionals uh, really secretly uh, done and uh, yeah I, I, I've seen on the news uh, news uh, the uh, shop owner uh, found to be criticized by uh, underwriting on the in front of the uh, shops and uh, uh, yeah get shocked and of course many people are supporting his business but uh, uh, there are some portion of the people in in the public uh, does exist just to, to criticize and uh, uh, those, those people and not caring about uh, yeah individuals have their own business and have their circumstances and different uh, uh, situations do they have but uh, well so we, we need a dialogue we need to talk but uh, yeah as I said uh, they uh, they are doing in in anonymous way so uh, really um, difficult so um, right well yeah we, we, we have I, I don't think we have any very nice clue to to solve those uh, problems um, but if I may mm. if, if I may join in a, a bit uh, because in Singapore we also face the same thing uh, xenophobic and uh, like Hospital people, if they put on their, their uniform, when they go out to work in the lift, they were being scolded and so on and so forth. And that's the reason why uh, uh, when these stories were reported uh, on social media, uh, I think the, the community who understand the concern came together and it became a national movement. Uh, so much so that uh, we have schools, we have students, we have general public coming out, step forward to, to send cards to express their support for all these uh, frontline workers, plus all the essential service people like uh, uh, there's this ambul ambulance driver. I mean, he was uh, a, a case of him having to uh, ferry patients in and out. He, he hardly had time to, to go for lunch. And once when he parked his ambulance uh, to go to a, a food court to buy lunch, he, he was actually shouted at and asked to, be, to, to go away. 
but there are people who saw it and actually went forward and bought the lunch for him. And, 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 and because of social media uh, sharing all the stories, so there's a movement came about. And that's why Singapore came out with uh, this, we are united, we are together, we have to build trust. And we have a lot of campaigns, so-called, to mobilize people to give the support. I think this trust is very important. And, and, and sadly, there are small pockets of people like this. And here again, I think science centers uh, and museums can play a part uh, to, to, to talk about not just the science, but the social behavior and to address the fear. I mean, fear is actually uh, the cause of that. And if it understands the situation, uh, the fear is, is no more the motivation for ostracizing people. I think this is a very important aspect, which I think all the science centers in the museum will engage our people. We need to address the psychology of how we handle pandemic and crisis. Thanks. I think it's very insightful uh, from the Japan story. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, maybe in the interest of time, we will continue to the last uh, speaker first. Then we have a round of questions at the end. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yasushi. Okay, last but not least, um, let me invite our final speaker, Dr. Amawati, who is the Head of Corporation Division at the Indonesia Institute of Sciences. She has expertise on science communication, disaster communication, and public relations management. She's been working at the Institute, Indonesian Institute of Sciences since 2006 and manages various corporate programs related to public campaigns of disasters preparedness, media relation, government relation, public campaigns of science and research result, and international corporate cooperation. Since 2009, she also has been a lecturer at Merku Bauna University. She teaches courses with a combined practical and academic dimension, such as public relations campaign, interpersonal skills, and research methodology. May I invite Dr. Irma, please? Okay. Thank you, Song John. Let me first share my screen. Okay, can you see yes. that? Yes, you can see that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, distinguished speakers, and also everyone here. Maybe for some of you, already good day. So this morning, I'm going to talk about science communication. Maybe a little bit different from the other speakers that I may bring the level of science communication to the institutional level, taking the case study of um, our science communication. So before I talk further about the science communication, let me uh, briefly introduce about my institution. So as I mentioned by Song Chong before that I'm working for the Indonesian Institute of Sciences or in Bahasa Indonesia we call it Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia or LIPI, L-I-P-E. So LIPI is the biggest and the oldest research institution in Indonesia. We cover all type of sciences. We cover earth science, uh, engineering science, social and community science, natural science, and also uh, scientific services. We have um, 32 research centers and also 12 technical implementation units all over Indonesia. Conducting research in all sciences is the main task of LIPI. So therefore we have more than 1,400 researchers all over Indonesia. So this is a brief global cooperation we have throughout the globe. And this morning, I also want to emphasize that I humbly welcome everyone here who may be interested to have scientific cooperation for us. I humbly welcome the invitation. So let's go further to the science communication. So in performing science communication, LIPI used so many media, including the social media and also the conventional media such television and radio. But in engaging the youth, we mainly focus on social media. Why social media? Because I believe all of us here already acknowledge the high number, the big number of social media users all over the world. In Indonesia itself, we have 160 million social media users, and it's more than 50% of our total population. For your information, Indonesia has more than 270 million people as our total population. So it is a big number of social media users in Indonesia. In conducting our science communication through social media, we have four 
social media accounts. They are Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, as you can see on my slide. In specifically uh, in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we have been communicating about various scientific uh, information about COVID-19. Not only about the COVID-19 itself, we also scientifically communicate about our research on COVID-19. We have many research applications regarding the COVID-19. For example, we have research on immune modulator by using herbal ingredient. We have robotic sterilizer, and we also have uh, oxygen uh, equipment for the uh, COVID-19. Not only research regarding engineering science, in regard to COVID-19, we also conducted um, social research on COVID-19. The main aim is to provide a scientific recommendation to the policymakers in response to the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia. Not only information about research, we also communicate uh, information about our research facility that can be used by the public, by the industry, for example, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. For example, here, this is our biosafety level three laboratory that currently is being used for the virus testing. We also communicate information about our scientific facility that can be used freely for the public. For example, here, free access to our electronic books and our electronic journals. So there are some examples of um, the information that we've been communicating through our social media accounts. And this morning, I want to emphasize the importance of having public engagement in all kind of communication process, including science communication. Why it is important to have public engagement in our science communication? Because uh, I also acknowledge that the first speaker, TM, already acknowledged the importance of having trust in our science communication. So by having public engagement, it can build trust relationship between us as the scientific uh, institution with the public. It also can engage public participation into our scientific discussion. It can promote mutual understanding, promote transparent and shared decision making. It also can reflect the inter interestingness or informational value of our post. It can reflect our interaction between us as the institution to the public. It also can reflect the principle of dialogue communication that we have been done with our public. And at last, it also can promote co-creation. And I already show you the advantages of having a public engagement in our science communication. But in practice, there are many challenges in having to encourage uh, public engagement in our science communication. Most science communication process, particularly the one performed by government institution, in general, not all government institution, in general, they are still conducting science communication in such a communication, one-way communication model. Although there are many institutional that already uh, use their social media accounts, unfortunately, social media is still uh, used as a complementary channel for disseminating information from the institution to the public without uh, strategically employ the participation principle to promote uh, public engagement in science communication. And currently, uh, there are increasement in the community and the institution to engage two-way interactive communication. But again, as I mentioned before, the practice has been performed in such a limited way. So there are some challenges in practice. It leads us to the next question. How can we encourage public engagement in our science communication through social media? I'm going to take a case study of our, I mentioned before that we have four social media accounts, but this morning I'm going to focus on our Instagram account. Why Instagram account? As you can see here, there is data that 
that uh, during COVID-19 pandemic, there is an increased social media usage. I think it's quite obvious for us because we have to work from home. Everything is being conducted through uh, social media, online meeting like now. But interestingly, the significant increase happened in the media, social media usage by age group of 16 to 34. And this number fits our Instagram followers Kitsley. As you can see that the Instagram followers of our account is dominated by the age number of 18 to 34. So how can we, okay, we already have the practice of science communication. We already have the social media accounts. How can we measure the social media engagement based on the existing studies on social media? There are many ways to measure social media engagement. It can use the context-based or obvious feature here by seeing the number of followers, by the numbers of hashtag, tweet length, or it can use structural features here. It also can use the Latin features here or content-based feature. This morning, I'm going to specifically focus on measuring the social media engagement based on the content-based feature here specifically based on content themes and multimedia feature. So this is the data of our Instagram account. I use the data from Instagram inside. The platform analyze the posts for me and provide which post has the highest, uh, the highest like, the highest engagement, the highest reach, and also the highest impression. As you can see here, that the posts with the most likes and the engagement, I compare this on this slide, that the likes, they are equally uh, dominated by the information, scientific information with the format of video and infographic. Meanwhile, the engagement here, they are um, dominated by information, scientific information in the format of infographic. How about the content? How about the information? What are the information about? As you can see here, the likes, uh, they are um, equally dominated by information about scientific facility and also about research application. Meanwhile, the engagement here, the information that were perceived as the most engaging by the public, they are information about research application. This is the reach and impression. So as you can see here, they both, the categories uh, have similar result. They both are um, dominated by information that takes a format of infographic and also the information that we were perceived as the most rich and the most impressed are information about research application. So if I can conclude, if we want to, uh, taking the case study of Instagram Lippy, uh, there are several content types that were regarded as the most engaging by the public. So it can be the information about research application, about scientific information about COVID-19, scientific recommendation based on our research, and also scientific facility that can be used by the public or that, that, that may be useful for the public related to COVID-19 and also uh, scientific clarification to hoax of COVID-19. So in conclusion, uh, during, COVID, uh, during pandemic of COVID-19 and also based on the existing studies on social media, apparently during a uh, health crisis, individuals are more focused on the message rather than the format of the message. So they are more concerned whether the scientific information they gain from our science communication can satisfy their needs on specific uh, scientific information. For example, it may be uh, unique, it may be different from one institution to another institution based on the main task of the institution. For example, 
LIPI, as I mentioned before, LIPI has a main task in conducting research. So apparently, information about research application is the information that are regarded uh, as the most engaging by the public. So it is important for us to have initial data about information that are required by the public, by the target audience of our science communication. The match between demand and supply also already raised by Kanikar before uh, that there is importance to match the demand of information with the supply of our scientific information. And it's also important to make sure that science communication is performed in such a dialogue loop. We need to make sure that our practice of science communication can provide opportunities to the public to be able to respond to the information that we shared before. It can be in the form of vote, in the form of survey, or in the form of just simply a question in the end of our post. And at last, uh, I suggest not only me, also existing studies of uh, social media to be able to achieve the best engagement in our science communication. It is important to combine the media richness and also the specific content type based on your specific task. For example, uh, maybe for science museum has different tasks with us, uh, with LIPI as a research institution. It can be information about your specific program or your specific product that can uh, help the public to understand or to respond to the COVID-19 uh, effectively and strategically. To combine media research and content type and also emotional in our science communication is um, advised to be able to achieve the uh, public engagement effectively in our science communication. So I think that's the end of my presentation. I welcome for the discussion regarding these matters and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. It's very informative. And I think um, the reach of your social media is really quite amazing. Oh, thank you. I will, I will let our social media team know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of content, um, the focus of your institute is mainly on research. So do you have a specialized team coming out with different content um, either each week or do they work closely with the researcher? Yes, uh, we have, um, is it mute or no? Yes, we have a special uh, social media team uh, to do science communication through social media and they work closely with the researchers. So not only weekly, but daily, they design uh, what specific uh, content they want to share on the social media based on the issue, the current issue. Right, okay. So then do you look further down the line in terms of your approach? So for example, do you plan the next month you're going to focus on certain team unless something uh, comes out suddenly? Yes, uh, we have the plan, a regular plan, but oh, I think uh, it also needs to be adaptive. If something uh, suddenly appear and it's important for the public, we can just easily switch the plan and do the content to respond to that specific issue. Right. Okay, uh, I think there are a few, a couple of questions. So maybe we, we can also merge this together with the, the panel discussion now. Um, so there's one question. With science topics that require currency like the pandemic, it seems like social media is an effective way to communicate the facts. Do you see any role for science centers in that space given the different nature of engagement? And has our center actively decided to engage or work through a science center to promote your findings? Uh, science Center, as I mentioned before that actually Science Center already has important role um, in, in disseminating scientific information about COVID-19. Maybe not specifically on research like us, but also like um, I believe that science communication also design information about science in the form of exhibition, in the form of product, for example. So I think it's also the principle can be uh, applied in, the, in, in, in practice of science communication, how to uh, design the science, uh, scientific information in such a way that can be easily understand, that can be uh, engage uh, public participation in science communication. I think the same principle also can be applied to the science center like, like science museum. Right. So there's another question. Is Instagram more effective than Facebook in Indonesia? 
Um, actually, it depends on the target audience because I understand that each uh, social media account has their own unique uh, audience. Profile, yeah. Yeah, for example, yeah. in Indonesia, as I mentioned before, that our Instagram followers are dominated by the age number of 18 to 35. So if mm -hmm. your target audience is, is that specific age, I recommend to use uh, Instagram, for example. So I think it's depend depend on your target audience and the um, the unique characteristic of your social media accounts in your specific country. For example, in Indonesia, Facebook are still dominated the uh, online communication. However, in our target audience, uh, Facebook are still dominated by the age higher age number, like um, forty is above. So again, it depends on your target audience. So we need to understand uh, the specific media that are being used by our target audience. Mm, okay. Great. Uh, there's probably one last question for, for uh, Dr. Ma. So how does social media team actively reach out to the target audience uh, to increase the outreach? Okay. How does the social media team actively reach out to the target audience to increase outreach? Um, our strategy is being consistent. So not necessarily, uh, it's not advice to have, for example, today we release 10 posts or 10 posts or and tomorrow nothing. Today's again, nothing. And then we post uh, again in the next three days. So we, we apply strategy of consistency. It's better to do one thing uh, each day uh, as long as you do it consistently to, 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 to increase the awareness of your target audience that your account is being active and that your account is, uh, is aiming to, to, to give information to the public. Yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, maybe I can, I can jump in here because uh, when, we, when we started to do online engagement, uh, uh, Song Chun, you were leading our, we call our transmedia team uh, because we realized that the Science Center is not open for public, so we use transmedia. We use all kinds of social media, Instagram, uh, uh, YouTube even. And uh, I think I think I think what what we learn from you is actually very very helpful. Uh, I see a request already asking whether you could share your yeah <laughs> uh, So to to answer back to uh, I think Daniel, you asked two questions, which I think is open to all of us to to jump in. Uh, mm. One is uh, we we see more and more uh, importance of using uh, transmedia, all kinds of social media to reach out. And also because of the, the COVID-19, we are now moving into what we call a new norm. Uh, we don't expect big crowd. We are not encouraged to have big crowd until the vaccine is developed. We have to be still very controlled. And uh, because of that, uh, our science center, uh, we are moving into what we call a blended approach. In other words, we try to do a lot of things online. At the same time, we want people to come to the science center to, to come on site. So it's blended both online and on site kind of activities. And that's where social media come in in a big way. Another thing which is again, uh, related to social media and fast dissemination of information, which I think all the panel speakers talk about. And uh, I think that challenges science centers to, to, to be so-called timely, to use scientific evidence uh, with all the researchers coming up with information, biomedical innovation and so on we should be able to communicate just in time. And with social media, you can actually just in time spread out. Uh, so uh, in Singapore, we are also coming in to do such thing called a just in time science communication. And this is one of the challenges that we want to put up. And I think as an aspect community, we can also uh, share that as a platform. Uh, so I think uh, today is, is a good start so that uh, we can also make use of this online tools to remove us from the physical constraint. And we can actually literally do just-in-time communications with one another and also to reach out to our community. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I, I totally agree with you about the timely communication. Um, our social media team, um, they are most uh, mostly young people. So they are really eager to and have passion on social media. So that for the, they almost work 24 hours to 
to respond uh, to to design information for the social media. So yes, I I, I agree with you. Hmm. That's great. So now we open the floor uh, to any questions. Uh, Ganiga uh, put up her hand. Ganiga put up yeah. her oh, hand. Okay. Yeah, you never yes. watch. You must watch her. <laughs> I must watch her. Put her hand. Okay, okay. Yes, Ganiga. Yes. So I just just want to ask something, and that might be interesting for us to explore as well in terms of um, social media engagement. We 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 found that uh, sometimes um, using uh, uh, how do you call um, some certain image is also create um, some interest you know uh, for the for the audience which could bring uh, could get them engaged unexpectedly we we produce some um, online content and actually it's a series about animals but when we found that when we use uh, some image not necessarily beautiful one but maybe um, weird or uh, sometimes it looks, it even looks a little bit scary, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it becomes uh, more popular and a lot of people share those contents. Um, I, I think this is something, this is another thing we, we could explore in terms of research. Uh, what sort of um, uh, graphics or photos that people would be hooked to, you know, um, and then be interested to follow those contents, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you uh, because sometimes um, each content has different result in uh, each uh, case study. For example, uh, maybe sometimes the video format can be more engaging rather than just the plain text. But some studies also show that apparently using video can reduce the uh, public engagement. So it can be various, um, depends on the, on the case. So I think, yeah. Um, may I ask a question um, sure. uh, to, to Ganiga, actually, the, uh, this is about the role of a scientist. So in Thailand, uh, we've had uh, the importance of the messages from uh, a scientist and also the uh, charismatic uh, science communicators appear on TV and uh, 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 delivering the uh, messages continuously. Uh, but uh, um, in scientific world, uh, there may also be uh, some dif opinion differences occur. And uh, scientist A says this, but scientist B said completely different thing, and that may happen. So in Thailand, in your country, so is it sort of the always consistent, the, what was said by scientists, uh, uh, sort of the uh, unique voice or some uh, conflict or confusion happened? I was uh, wondering. Uh, yeah, well, I, there are uh, sometimes uh, conflicting uh, opinions of um, scientists uh, happen in, 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 media, in, in public communication, but I would say that it, uh, it's fewer cases in Thailand, maybe it's a little bit different from Japan and many other countries. I, I would say that um, uh, scientists' engagement in communication of science is still quite, uh, quite, quite low. So uh, whenever there is an issue uh, related to science that we need scientists uh, come out to communicate, there are only few scientists are willing to do so. Uh, that's why at, at this moment, you know, there are not many conflicting um, opinions, but, but of course there are some, but still quite few. I, I think um, we have done some, some um, survey on uh, barrier to communicating science, you know, among um, scientists. And interestingly, um, scientists themselves doesn't feel like they are uh, they have uh, confidence you know in communicating science that's one of the reason and another reason is the time and the policy uh, we have a lot of regulations you know um, that uh, so 
let's say scientists in certain agency cannot just come out and and talk you know about a certain thing so uh, when when it the press need some uh, information if they reach to research agency they need to be approved uh, in order to give um, information to to the media and this is a big uh, barrier in, in uh, at the current time uh, I think the the ministry is trying to kind of improve this situation okay so uh, at this moment most of the time the scientists that come out and talk are from universities they have more freedom to um, give information and give opinion but still only very few um, if you uh, uh, trust the uh, you know um, news on on like i say media on in thailand only very few scientists come out and, and talk like this yeah mm -hmm. okay thanks well concerned with that uh, maybe another uh, important item is the data uh, maybe number of patients or the how actually this infection is spread in the community. Those precise uh, data is really needed to uh, uh, tackle on this uh, disaster and to take the uh, proper measure. But uh, in Japan, uh, so far, uh, it's not yet very successful about taking the accurate data and to make it open for uh, for, to, for starting the uh, open discussion among uh, uh, scientific community as well as uh, media and uh, yeah, involving the, all, all the stakeholders. So, um, well, yeah, just, just I want to raise this issue so that, that taking data and make it publicly available is very important under this kind of disaster. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, that's the reason why uh, Singapore set up uh, uh, an app, gov.sg, is Government Singapore. And we can actually download the app. So every day we get information update, like today's detection, how many, and so on and so forth. And uh, I think Singapore is small, therefore we can actually trace everybody. Everybody is, is, uh, is in the so-called data list. So our numbers are actually tightly uh, monitored to be updated. Uh, that's, that's the reason why this morning when I give the talk, I could update yesterday's total number with a curve and so on. Uh, I agree with you that the numbers are very important because this is a number game, right? I mean, the, the, the spread is exponential and, and uh, we really need to have this number to make a lot of informed decision. Yeah. I, I, I have a question. Um, and what do you think about uh, the next wave? Ah. <laughs> well, we already saw in, in Australia, right, they are locking yeah, yeah, yeah. down again, and uh, uh, I think there's a chance of that happening. Uh, that's the reason why uh, uh, I didn't put up uh, another bit of uh, infographic slide, it's about how Singapore plan to reopen phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, and uh, we are being very careful. Uh, I think likelihood of certain phase, uh, a second uh, wave coming back, in certain community is there. I mean, the, because the behavior, if it's not controlled, even you have a cure, the, the spread is actually through behavior, it's not through science that it's spread, it's through behavior, human-human contact and so on, yeah. And, and uh, lately there could be even a hint that it could be airborne. It's being more scary, right, it's airborne. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Very hard to prevent, them. yeah. Okay, maybe in the interest of time, we'll take one last question by order. So I think the last question is, uh, looking back at your social media efforts with your various uh, museums or centres, uh, what would you have done differently to further improve the results? So Just anyone wants to know. start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, regarding the social media efforts, if I can uh, add, maybe improve improve the the approach is to involve the scientists within the science communication network so if you're talking about sci institutional social media sometimes the actor can be just so the social media accounts itself just the institutional so to be able to achieve the most effective way to engage the public it is important to also use personal network 
of the scientists. So the network of information can be go to can be expand further and also in such a credible way because it involves the scientists uh, network to the public. So if I can add that to our social media efforts. Yeah, you can also bear in mind now that we've got the SPEC network, you can tap on us as well, working with all the science museums and science centers. We can amplify the effort. <laughs> okay, I think we have overran. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I hope you have enjoyed the session as much as I did. So um, just like to uh, reiterate this webinar is a start of kind of a series of transmedia collaboration across the SPEC network. And I think the main aim, we hope to amplify the good work and the impact of science communication across the uh, entire aspect network. So if you are interested to be part of this, um, I think uh, Ingshan will send, uh, will, will flash a slide with my email address, uh, so you can email me. And could I also trouble you to scan the QR code uh, to give us some feedback on what you think of today's session and how we can actually improve uh, today's session as well. So I look forward to hosting more of such webinars in the next few months with you. And also I think hopefully, in the near future, I want to meet you physically face to face so that we can catch up uh, during the aspect conference or any other conference as well. So uh, in the meantime, please stay safe, uh, stay healthy and also have a good lunch uh, wherever you are. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, all speakers. Thank you, Mary Bell. Thank you, Thanks Daniel. Very well. <laughs> ah, Daniel, yes, you asked a few questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everybody. Okay. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>